Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report Hour 3, which is on Thursdays. Tim Alexander, Lord Sterling. His website, you can Google Lord Sterling, S-T-I-R-L-I-N-G. You're a business with one S dot blogspot dot com. At the bottom of the hour, we'll have Chris Harris, our nuclear expert from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission on Fukushima and what's happening here in America and around the world. Tim, you have some breaking news, as always, and, of course, you do emergency reports. You post up on our live stream channel and pop in on any day. You have a permission to pop in any day as a uh, co-broadcaster, literally dropping, I call it, info bombs, uh, bad news, and uh, turning points in history. <laughs> yes, well, you know. Uh, well, good, good news doesn't. Uh, uh, yeah, good news is rare. You know, as they say, it's rare as a, as a, as a white crow, as they say. You know, I, I, I have been watching and following uh, all of this stuff that has been building and transpiring in the Middle East for a long time now, and I get sick of being the <laughs> the voice of doom. Uh, but and, or just and, the and voice of truth, the voice of the well, voice of yeah. sanity. How about if, in fact, a lot of these things we could actually just pull back from or take a rational policy, we wouldn't do it because we may. I, there's a difference between what I call accidents and on purposes. Most of the stupid things, including coming out of the Obama administration and the previous George Bush administration, going back for years, has been on purposes. This is just stupid policy carried through to the nth level, which will result in destruction, death, bankruptcy, and other nasty things happening. Yeah. Well, uh, according to Press TV, now this is the... Um, uh, Iranian uh, uh, news, uh, online news uh, channel, and they're actually fairly good. Of course, they present things with uh, an Iranian uh, a slant, uh, but uh, the, overall, they're they're not too too terrible uh, in terms of uh, credibility or anything like that. Now. They have just come out uh, with kind of a uh, scary thing, and this this is one of these things. You know, you say it's it's been a, kind of a slow news day with some things on um, um, uh, some aspects of the Middle East. So you know, you think, oh well, maybe you know things aren't going to be too bad. Then you read this and you say, oh man. Well, here's what they say. Um, on Monday, in a meeting in Brussels, NATO military leaders in consultation uh, with officers and military forces in several former Soviet republics, major African states, Israel, Saudi Arabia, and the Persian Gulf states came to combine decision to act against Syria. Um, and NATO has secretly authorized a Syrian attack. Now, there, there's not been a, a timetable set um, or so forth. Uh, yesterday, Divka, which is uh, an Israeli site that's often called the posting board uh, for uh, the Israeli Mossad, said that the Russians were pulling out of Syria. Howsoever, uh, the chief of staff of the Russian armed forces uh, vehemently denied that and said that uh, simply wasn't the case. Um, I would tend to believe him more than the Mossad. But anyway, uh, we do seem to continually be uh, taking uh, steps in the direction of of uh, something really terrible. Uh, but there are two very positive things. Uh, of course, a month ago, the Israeli generals basically mutinied and refused to go to war uh, when there was this false report that uh, Saad had moved his chemical weapons to air bases near Israel and was preparing an imminent attack. It was a lie, and they refused to go to war on that basis. Um, and basically said so. And the Western media very gave it hardly no coverage. Uh, the Israeli media gave it some coverage, but if you you know if you knew where to look, and of course I carried it on my site, uh, it was very clearly it was 
basically a mutiny. Now, um, about a week and maybe a half ago, the General Dempsey, the chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, flew in Israel to see Bibi Netanyahu, that uh, peace-loving uh, individual who's just itching uh, to start World War III, uh, and basically told him no, the same as the Israeli generals had said, that the uh, American uh, military leadership was not prepared to uh, follow a scenario that would begin the Third World War. And it, they didn't really care whether he liked it or not. Um, and Dempsey got on his plane and flew to Afghanistan, and the plane was uh, hit uh, at night in the most heavily and expensively protected base on Earth. Uh, back in Air Force Base in Afghanistan, they, we've spent $2 billion just on airfield security at that facility. And they almost shot his plane down. A couple people on the plane were injured. He was he was uninjured. And that could not have been uh, some raghead with a shoulder launch missile. Uh, it almost certainly came, uh, it was an order from Netanyahu. So essentially what you have is kind of a stalemate at the very highest levels. The professional military people uh, are, are saying no to World War III, but there are other forces, extraordinarily powerful forces, that are pushing uh, this. And, when, and what you saw the meeting in, in, in Brussels was essentially a political meeting. meeting. So where, what's going to happen and how soon is something going to happen, uh, I can't tell you. Uh, I can tell you that there are very strong forces on both sides, uh, some very powerful people that have a brain and uh, maybe some morality and or at least don't want to die. And uh, because there's only one planet we live on, and that's Earth, uh, and don't want to blow it up. There are others who are basically uh, stooges of, of Lucifer and are determined to start uh, the Third World War. Time will tell. Yeah, exactly. Now, we have some interesting things, of course. Uh, uh, Emir Peretz uh, says Israel is running out of time, and of course he talks about the elected mayor of Zedarot at age 31, headed of the Histadrut, Israel's organization of trade unions, led the Labor Party. Served yeah, as the he used defense to be minister. a defense minister. Yeah, and of course, uh, uh, personally, I disagree with this idea of a two-state policy. It's not going to ever work because Palestinians are never going to have peace. People have to understand that. But the current Israeli policy of just a preemptive attack isn't going to work either. What they need to really realize is that under, right now under Bashar Assad, what we have to do is stabilize these weapons so they can't be taken over by the terrorists that we're supporting. The guys that we're supporting to attack Assad are more likely to be mu much more dangerous than Assad. In well, terms of we, we, we uh, Dr. Bill, we can't do anything uh, to, if we attempt to stabilize, uh, as you put it, Assad's weapons, he'll use them. Those are his, uh, that's his trump card. And Assad is not an aggressive fool. Uh, Assad does not intend to use his weapons of mass destruction unless his country, uh, his entire country, is at state uh, at, at danger of being overrun. And uh, what, about, what if we weapons. propose uh, his what if father we had them? What if we propose something that's what I call a reasonable middle ground, which would require collaboration with Russia and China? Well, and he won't go along with that. And, and, and you, if we, we propose the same thing with Israel, how about uh, with Russia we, we say, okay, Israel, you've got to give up your nuclear weapons. They're, they're, they're too dangerous. Uh, you're a tiny state. You shouldn't have uh, hundreds well, and hundreds of I, I don't of know. If, I, don't know if, yeah, I, well, I think of Israel as being American territory, so it's not a matter of giving up the, uh, the nuclear weapons. But I think we need to have American... Or is uh, America Israeli territory? Well, either way. It'd be, it's, it's reality. The fact is, though, what we need to do is we need to actually sit on their necks so they don't use them. But we also have to make certain that the surrounding nations aren't stupid enough to let the extreme Muslims start firing at Israel because the Israelis are twitchy and they'll shoot. That, that is certainly true.
welcome back. And um, right now, of course, the polls are saying that Obama's ahead. Uh, they had a pretty, a pretty good uh, speech from Paul Ryan at the GOP convention, although they did a very nasty thing on Tuesday. They didn't treat the uh, Paul, Ron Paul delegates very properly or the conservative right Christian pro-lifers uh, and basically said, now that we've won, just vote for us. And we won't let you even have a proper speech without kind of proofreading the speech before Ron Paul could come on the stage. Well, I yeah, think they that- told Ron Paul he could give a speech if he if he said he would unequivocally endorse uh, uh, Romney, and uh, if if Romney could per- uh, was able or his people were able to virtually vet every word that uh, Ron Paul was going to say. I don't think that's reasonable at all. I think that's ridiculous. No. Well, it's insulting. Well, not only insulting, it's insulting the whole democratic process of the delegates and who's going to select. I mean, if you blow away your base, I mean, this is an election for Romney to lose because Obama's done so many stupid and bad things that Obama, you know, you'd otherwise think that how could he lose the election? Well, so far, Obama still had seven points, and this is even after Ryan joined the fray, and which you would have figured well, otherwise would. What Gerald Clemente says about uh, um, the the politicians at the top in America? <laughs> he always has a, some interesting taglines. He calls them uh, uh, two, uh, two, uh, two uh, What is it? A, a two bit circus or a, uh, yeah, something like that? Uh, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and let's see, I thought I wrote it down. Let's see. Uh, two bit freak show. That's it. <laughs> Well, I call, it, I call it the selection, not the election. Obviously, what's going on in the GOP now, if they wanted to win, here's the formula, real simple. Number one, they treat the delegates with respect. They let Ron Paul say his say. They actually do things in policy changes, which means they're going to put the person who would issue forward in this term of election, if, Ron, if Ryan and Ryan get in. They're going to deal with Glass-Steagall and get it instituted. They're going to have a budget that balances and doesn't cut the hell out of the military or, or downgrade our, our nuclear forces by 90% unilaterally. At the same time, doesn't have austerity fascism to hurt the seniors. Starts to have a credit system where we print money to deal with our economic issues and then stop industrial espionage in China and put tariffs up against goods that are predatorily you mean like dropping all the goods. Good common sense things that anybody with half a brain would do. Yeah, exactly. Which would bring back, you know, millions of jobs to Americans, bring back a credit system that will allow business to get credit again, will allow the, the value of homes to drop to its current market value, but allow people to keep their equity in their home. I, I, I want to draw an analogy, and, 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 and uh, this is on Romney, but please don't take it as a support of the teleprompter reader in chief. Um, Remember uh, Rock Hudson. There was a period of time, this was many years ago, uh, and viewers as old as me will remember, but Rock Hudson was the, the stud in Hollywood. He was he was the he-man that all American women should want to lust after, according to the Hollywood movie mongrels. The insiders, though, it was a real joke, because the insiders knew that he was as gay as a three-and-a-half-dollar bill. Right. He, had, he wasn't attracted to women at all all uh but it was the, the the they had this facade and that was an insider's joke well i think romney in a sense is an insider's joke uh by the global elite they've used wall street to decimate american the american industrial base the american middle class the american economy they've used the money junkies on wall street to just gut us and Romney is one of the money junkies. Well, he's a big capitalist, okay? The yeah, fact and, is, though... And they're running, okay, so they're running a money junkie, and they're laughing their butts off. It's like, ha, ah, look at all the people supporting uh, one of our money junkies, and, and, and we're using the money junkies to destroy America. Of course, we've also used uh, uh, Obama even more so. It's, it's, it's damned if you do, damned if you don't. Right. Well, I think we're I think we're more damned if we about American politics. Well, I think uh, here's the thing, though. I think that uh, Romney Ryan, and I would call it Ryan Romney, is more likely to put a a balanced budget that won't destroy the military or and will allow the preservation of Medicare in some form or other. Whereas Obama will destroy public health care, the budget, and 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 cow America and reduce our military forces and institute green policies that will destroy the country. The first the first term. I'm not saying a word in defense uh, of. Yeah, I I think. Obama, abominator because Ob- he is yeah, the abominator. <laughs> uh, his second term will resemble the first term of Vladimir Lenin. Uh, 
well, you're you're giving Vladimir Lenin a bad name now. But yeah, anyway, well, yeah. But I think I, I think Vlad Vlad could we would speak up and say yes, you you shall Sovietize those dang Yankees. Yeah, uh, but the, but the the other thing is, uh, look, the one monster that you have to drive a stake through is the Federal Reserve. Yeah, well, it and the thing is that be, they, they, they've been backed off on this. They have these foreign central bankers, and they're mostly foreign, running our government, running our money supply, printing money out of thin air, loaning it to the United States at interest, and then buying off all of our politicians so we have perpetual wars and perpetual uh, uh, false welfare yeah. programs that the, make e things worse. Even Gerald, uh, uh, even Gerald Salenti says you don't abolish the video, just take it over. You don't well, even need that, audit. That, that, that abolishes it in the farm it's in. I mean, yeah. it becomes we don't, a, we don't allow the old game. In other words, you don't have foreign banks as part of our Fed Reserve. It's only U.S. banks. Everything's open to a full audit. Uh, there's no, uh, and we actually there's no printing the money to, to support that. The, no printing money for the European Central Bank, no laundering illegal drug money, none of this other foolishness. Credit available so small business can get there. For example, they should have had a moratorium four years ago against uh, foreclosures for businesses and for homes. They should have let houses... They should have been throwing bank presidents in prison for authorizing robo-signing and all the fraud that took place. They're still doing it. And by the way, that's, that's not stopped. They're still let the robo-signing continue, and it's not changed. So what's happened well, is it's a green light. how many people on Wall Street have gone to jail? I don't think any, have there? Uh, no. Uh, what was that con artist that uh, fleeced a bunch of people? But he, he really wasn't so... <laughs> Uh, he was kind of outside of Wall Street. I mean, the real Wall Street players, the big banks, nobody has even been hauled in front of a grand jury. No, no. I think they're still getting uh, hot rock massages uh, in their uh, places in Indonesia, in their vacation homes. They're still stacking up their bills and sticking in their private uh, wall safe. And they're still... Uh, you know, just laughing all the way to the bank and saying, okay, when they call on their little red phone, as, uh, you know, who said, you know, you remember the old statement, he said, I'm going to go down to uh, Wall Street and not to Washington, D.C., and they said, the media asked uh, uh, this famous filmmaker, and I want you to see if you know who it is, and he said, I'm not going to, uh, to Washington, D.C., I'm going to their bosses in Wall Street. No, I don't know. Uh, yeah, you know who it is. Uh, you know, remember uh, uh, Columbine, uh, the uh, Columbine, uh, the uh, filmmaker for Columbine? Oh, you're talking about um, uh, where's the baseball cap? Heavy, uh, kind of heavy set. Uh, I'll, I'll leave you with it for a minute to see how many uh, people there remember him because he makes these profound statements, but then he, guy, believe it or not, he's on the left. But the fact is, there's people on the left and right that are starting to kind of get it. Even people that supposedly supported Obama, if the undecided really had an alternative with a heart, a, a right that had a heart, as we talked about this with uh, with uh, Robert Davi, the actor and singer, you know, Davi yeah. sings Sinatra. If we really had a right with a heart, guess what? Obama would just be history. And we would correct all the wrongs. We'd have a health care that work. We'd have Social Security work. We'd have a military that wouldn't be uh, without equipment. Welcome back, and we are joined again with Tim Alexander with Chris Harris. Chris, you've got some amazing reports to tell us uh, what's going on. What's happening? Well, we did discuss last week about whether uh, they actually pulled the two new fuel assemblies from the Fukushima Unit 4 spent fuel pool. Actually, actually, it's not a spent fuel pool. They're in, it's a, in their own, their own uh, storage area. Uh, so it wasn't really, the, it wasn't indicative of what's going on in the spent fuel pool. That's where you store new fuel. But, but they pulled out those two. And you asked me what, what went on with the five weeks between then and now. Well, and, and today was released some pictures of it. There was some corrosion. There was some rust, as we uh, as we thought there would have been from the salt water. But most importantly, you know, they're saying there's no damage. They've inspected them. There's some good pictures in the article that I did send you. But uh, there are uh, embedded in it, and I don't really understand how they got how that got in there. But due to the explosion, there are chunks of concrete, like they're calling them two centimeter concretes, and for for us. 
us uh, guys who use the English system, that's like a one-inch chunk of concrete uh, peppered or embedded into the spent fuel of uh, actual the, the rods that comprise the assembly. Well, so, you know the difference uh, between a detonation and a you know the difference between a detonation and a deflagration, right? Yeah. Detonation is over a thousand uh, foot per, uh, miles per hour, which means basically they had a nuclear explosion occur in reactor cooling pool four, which is like a shotgun aimed up with a nuclear explosion occurring right there, and that of course blew pieces of, of not only radioactive fuel rods but also the concrete there. They also had a detonation in reactor number two because they know that the reactor core was broken. Uh, there was a detonation there, so there's concrete chunks flying everywhere and radioactive uh, fuel rods. Uh, flying everywhere, including in f cooling pool number three, the, uh, that one the detonated went straight up. There were chunks of plutonium MOX fuel reactor pellets that went flying everywhere up to maybe 50 kilometers away. Uh, well, uh, guys, when you say detonation, you're not talking about. Uh, well, 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 explain to a poor dummy like me exactly. Well, a detonation what's is just detonating. a faster. Is it hydrogen gas or is it. Uh, uh, no, uh, if you have a hydrogen explosion, it's probably a deflagration where you get a, basically an explosion, but it's below a thousand miles per hour. When it's a detonation, it means it's a high explosive, like RDX or a nuclear explosion or something that's real high, like a, like VX, like a, one of these you know plastic uh, kind of explosives. Okay, but, but uh, what's what's there to explode? When you say nuclear, I mean you're not. We well, you had a hydrogen triggered nuclear explosion, is what happened. That's what they think happened. When Arnie Gunderson talked about that in some of his video clips, if you go to uh, to Fairwinds, you can actually see that. So, it uh, must be, but it must be fairly low because the the, the oh the yeah, you can have low yield. You can have, these tunable ones that I was told when I was uh, taking care of people working. Uh, in the Oklahoma City Murr building, the, uh, the guys told me, one of the guys told me that they had tunable or adjustable micronukes the size of a large softball that could be tuned down to a hundredth of a kiloton, uh, right up to uh, 15 to, uh, to 100 kilotons. And these were adjustable, so uh, they could have small ones that were used for, for uh, explosives, so you could actually have a tunable uh, micronuke that was using these advanced uh, technologies for explosion uh, that we're giving amazing amounts of yield that was very adjustable. Yeah, I, 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 I they, I, they adjust them by by uh, lowering or raising uh, the uh, uh, the weapons grade material in uh, yeah. the. Um, I guess it's a spear, but I don't see how they do that. But anyway, yeah. uh, whatever it is that they're going to to detonate, it. if it's a if it's well, not, not a they, spear, it's a pancake. They, that they're well, they told me they weren't using they weren't using the typical type of explosives like plastic that would explode the core and compress it. They're using what's called high speed cryotron switch supercapacitors. So it was basically a supercapacitor uh, type of a detonation. Which is a standard implosion implosion thermonuclear device, basically. Yeah, exactly, and that's why they can miniaturize them. Uh, we need. To God, talk about some other issue here that uh, Chris brought up that I thought was really shocking, and it was the whole idea of cyber warfare and the SCADA, which are the uh, control systems for the for the power, uh, if you want to call it the power switch yards, outside all these nuclear reactors. And it turns out the IP address uh, that showed up, I want you to tell the whole story, uh, was not American. Uh, can you fill in the details, uh, Chris? Tell us all about that. Yeah, well, you know, this uh, this fellow is a um about uh, he wrote the article. Oh my goodness! Uh, what was his name again? Um, uh, hold on one second. Let me just grab this. Yeah, I have the article. It'll be posted over so people actually can read it themselves. It was actually from okay, ControlDesign.com. All right, that, that's 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 good. Yeah. I, um, to, to make a long story short, he is a programmer in the field of SCADA. Now you know we've been we've been harping on what SCADA is for a while now because. This year alone, there have been at least several unexplained loss of power at several power plants this year. And you know, I just threw out there for conjecture, saying, you know, if anybody's got control of the grid through the SCADA network, then you can you could just you can't really get inside of a plant. You can't start twiddling with all the controls in there, but you can take away the electrical power. Right, you know, we're doing cause a station blackout, and the hot shot down here at San Onofre probably is one of the major reasons why that entire new uh, 
steam turbine generators were put in the last two years by Hitachi Corporation, why they broke down. Because the hot shutdown already blew this design fault uh, turbines to pieces, which is why, you know, literally thousands of these steam turbine tubes blew up. And it means the SCADA, they turned out, what, what, what you show, what plant was it that showed this? But they actually had a Russian IP address that was actually found linked to the SCADA failure at this plant. Which plant was it? Well, this, this, was, this, this particular plant was a, uh, a water treatment plant and a pumping station that was shown to have um, uh, control by remote control via a Russian... Uh, a Russian IP address, but here's the here's the problem though. SCADA is used in the grid, sewage treatment plants, water treatment plants, any other major grid you can think of. And I just wanted to just kind of reiterate in here that if you've got, it's also called a PLC or a yeah, PLC forward slash SCADA. SCADA. Yeah, so people can search right. that PLC forward slash SCADA S C A D A. And what it means is that they can hack into it from China, from the Blue Army there. They actually have an Iranian cyber warfare army, Syrian cyber warfare. And this is Russian. The Russians are very good at mathematics. They can hack in. And one of the first attacks you may have is that your sewage treatment plant's down. Also, you have a station blackout to nuclear plants that they don't have proper backup power beyond four to eight hours. Not good. May I ask an obvious question? We've known that, that, that we're at risk here because of this kind of stuff for years. Why in the heck is all this stuff still on the Internet? I don't understand why we don't have systems to block IP addresses from other countries or we can't verify that or certain IP address uh, are allowed. It, to me, it's, why isn't there some kind of a buffer to say, well, no, you can't hack onto the darn Internet or to get onto SCADA well, or can, the power grid? Well, if that, why, why should a, uh, uh, access to a control grid uh, be through the Internet? Isn't that crazy? Yeah, no, Tim, uh, Dr. Bill and I had this conversation before we went on the air. You know, we pretty much threw our hands up in the air. Either, either they allow it to happen, they want it to happen, or they don't know what to do about it. You know? Well, why don't they have a separate fiber optic system was just completely separate from the Internet for all the grid? And I personally yeah. believe in what I call a decentralized grid, where you have a background grid, but you have what I call a micro grid. In other words, you have a territorially, um, let's say, Liquid propane, liquid natural gas, or propane micro generators that can cover a territory. If the grid starts to go or starts to get wonky, they'll just kick on and disconnect from the major grid, so it doesn't spread like a cancer. What happens is, and what happened in Yuma, Arizona last year, September 8th, is somebody hit a few keystrokes in Yuma, Arizona, because they had a transient surge on the grid of the power coming out of a nuclear reactor. What they did then is they hit a few keystrokes, and that literally caused a power wave that started shutting down breakers all the way through, and by the time it got to San Onofre, they had a hot shutdown, which actually destroyed their equipment. Not good, and my radiation detector went up for four days. So that's what I call, not an on purpose, not, a stu- not an accident, that's a stupid design flaw, and they need to smarten up real quick, and they lost no a lot care. of money. Southern California Edison and uh, these idiots, now they aren't going to be able to uh, get the plants back up because they blew it. Welcome back, and uh, so let's continue this report. Um, when we look at all of the news that's going on, we have the impending attack, which, you know, honestly, they need to secure the weapons. But one of the best ways to do it is to come clean with the Bashir Assad, to also uh, have an international force to make sure that the, there is no movement toward having an Islamic bomb in, in uh Tehran and also to stabilize the weapons in Pakistan. But people don't understand that if we attack Iran, Pakistan's already said it's going to be an ally of Iran. We need to also realize that a preemptive attack on Syria, they will use the weapons against us and against Israel. Israel will then go to the, uh, the Samson option. What I think needs to happen is something that's probably not going to happen is some rationality to say, let's control and stabilize these weapons of these disparate forces at each other's throats and we're very likely to be seeing if there is a regional war an attack on the Bashir reactor that's fully fueled with hundreds of Russian scientists and technicians this uh, situation is very nuts and I, I think it's very probable that, that if the things deteriorate in the Middle East there may not, and it happens before the election there won't be one 
Um, and I think the course well, situation in Japan will be because it could be so chaotic here. And uh, I can't get a straight so answer. For, down. By the way, I sent my I did an article uh, that I'm going to be published in the American Academy of Environmental Medicine. I sent a copy this morning to you. Um, to have a, a quick look at it that's going to be published by the Academy. I sent a copy also to Senator Feinstein and Senator Wyden's office, and I don't know what kind of response, but they don't understand that the Fukushima Daiichi is the biggest environmental disaster in human history. And I'm not exaggerating on that. This is hundreds of times worse than Chernobyl. This is far worse than even the, the Macondo uh, disaster in the, in the Gulf of Mexico. It's a different kind of disaster. And by the way, that disaster is not over. They're still using Corexit. They still have seeping oil in the bottom of the Gulf. It's still affecting global weather patterns and killing no, people all over the world. Not only that, I have a feeling that subsidence down in that's occurring along the Gulf Coast where those giant uh, sinkholes are occurring uh, and the uh, tremors are occurring along the New Madrid fault system are directly connected to the Macondo area. So I think there's some geological connections there. And we're going to start seeing some earth changes that are going to really... Uh, not make our day, let's put it that way, in the next couple of years. And I'm not being negative. I tell people if you're proactive and you plan for certain kinds of disasters, you can adapt to them and you can survive them. But if you assume everything's going to be a sunny day and everything's perfectly and it's not a nice day, it's not smooth sailing. <laughs> and if you're ready for a non smooth sailing day, it may be you may what be you're saying, you're saying is it's fun, uh, it's nice to go sailing, but take your life preserver just in case. Exactly, yeah. So. Chris, what do you, you think is happening in Fukushima? I'm looking at my radiation detector, and it's doing funky things. I'm seeing it, and it does really short, snappy surges. It'll go up to, like, 70, and then it'll drop to, like, 45, 50. I'm thinking, what? It's shooting up again, but it doesn't last long. And this kind of tells me, uh, I got a report that, that a few days ago, that they had the 61st major we call release. This is a term they use in Japan. Can you kind of highlight what a release is? Because they're releasing millions of tons of highly radioactive water with billions of becquerels of radiation uh, into the ocean and they're releasing it into the air and nobody's even talking about the fact that we're not getting data I've been repeatedly asking these senators offices including the expert there at uh, Senator Feinstein's office and by the way Senator Wyden's office in Oregon if you're living in Oregon you need to contact Senator Wyden they're not responding to my calls or emails. Nothing. Not even a, please don't call back. Nothing. Uh, I'm amazed. I mean, these people are remarkable, and I want, I want answers. And it's going to be published in the Academy. Um, I was going to do a presentation this coming October, but that paper is available for people to have a look at with references. And it's not the, fir the final paper either. It's going to be many papers written on this issue because a disaster is going to cause birth defects, every illness you can imagine, destruction of food supplies where the food is going to get increasingly radioactive. And when you interact it with all the other biotoxins in the environment and the danger of a possible regional nuclear war in the Middle East, and it will be nuclear. This will go nuclear very fast, and it will also go biological very fast. Well, okay, yeah, that's a good question, Gary. You know, and a release really pertains to the water is accumulating inside these plants for several reasons. First of all, the, the, there's a leak, leaks in the reactors and leaks in the containment building, and they got to keep adding water to keep the thing cool. That's one source of water that goes in clean, cleaner, and comes out really contaminated. Also, groundwater gets leaked into the plant, um, and also rainwater. So. Well, remember, we talked a long time ago, you got to stop the influx of, of, of clean water. This is just basic contamination control, because it's all going to come out radioactive. So now they have uh, the makeshift system that we talked about. They're going to use the filtration system so they can at least recycle some of the water. But some of the water, really what you're ending up doing is you're making the, um, the, the product, really, from the filtration plant is something called sludge. And this sludge is, uh, well, we, we talked about it last time, it was... Thousands of gallons of this has got it. This is the most radioactive stuff around. It's got chunks of fuel in it and everything else. Everything you don't want, mostly cesium at this point, from what I've read. Uh, they got to store this on site. Now the release part of it is anything that that's clean enough to release because there's no room in the tanks anymore. They're ordering new, new tanks, and we said that if you're going to have a, um, if you're going to keep on using this uh, this technology where you filter out the existing uh, radionuclides and pumping fairly clean water again, you still have that, you're still going to get waste. 
Well, you got to convert it to a solid waste so that they can transport safely in double-hauled ships to a final depot in the bottom of a zinc mine or some other place in a giant, giant trench deep in the ocean. They've got to do something that makes a lot more sense so the stuff is stabilized for billions of years. But I don't see any international consortium. I don't see the U.S. government involved. Obama's prancing around, uh, acting like, well, it's important to get me reelected. Who cares about Japan? And uh, it lacks any common sense whatsoever. I mean, we have a Hollywood, you know, love fest of, you know, if you just worship Obama, he'll give more change and everything will be fine. And nobody in the government is doing anything. The Environmental Protection Agency, RADnet, isn't being operated properly. We have no analysis of food, water, or anything. And we don't have American experts reporting in the regular snooze media anything about what they're going to do to prevent radiation from coming to America or, as I mentioned before, radiation plume detection using detectors. Uh, you can go to our website affiliate, Less EMF. You can get a, a little detection USB port, hook it up to your laptop or your you know, iMac or whatever, uh, or, or even your Kindle, and then just directly connected to your uh, to your radiation detector you know like your inspector plus or inspector exp you can have a continuous record throughout your entire flight and you can even press periodically to get the gps coordinates because your cell phone will tell you your gps coordinates or your ipad and you can take a photograph of it and know exactly where at different altitudes and different places along your flight paths what the radiation is but the government's going to do nothing and if they do know anything they're not going to tell us because they don't want us to know that we're all dying from radiation poisoning. They don't want to tell you. And, of course, your body's going to replace damaged cells if you're taking the right Nutrimeds, if you're drinking clean filtered water and taking care of yourself. But if you're marginal, if you're, pre if you're a, a baby in utero, if you're an elderly person, if you have a serious health problem, it's going to kill you. And it's going to hurt and make you sick first before it does that. Oh, uh, just uh, that's just like a slide there. You're talking about... Uh, White House doing something or whatever. Remember, David Axelrod just came out in the New York Times uh, last week, uh, the 23rd, August 23rd, which I did send you uh, a copy of this. It shows how David Axelrod, which is uh, one of Obama's right-hand guys, uh, was on the board of director of Exelon and, and obtained favors in the form of lots of money. And, yeah, in other words, they're, they're, they consider nuclear, they consider improperly run nuclear power as green. Well, nuclear power, if it's going to be run properly, needs to unveil hidden technology like tokamak fusion reactors, safe nuclear reactors where there's no on-site radioactive material storage, conversion technology to solid nuclear waste that can remove on-site, no release of tritium from nuclear reactors to surrounding communities, but we don't have any of that. They don't have any endpoints talking about this or the idea that the real... Are you guys saying that our danger. politicians aren't taking care of us? I can't believe that. Well, they are. They're actually, they're, <laughs> they're actually cosmeticians for the more... Uh, you know what we should do is we change, change their terms from being politicians to being cosmeticians. Because they're actually... <laughs> that's what I mean. They're, they're cosmeticians for the, more, the, more, the mortician, for the mortician's office. So what they want to do is kind of plump up our cheeks, increase our collar, make us look good while we're dead. We'll never look better. <laughs> you make a really good looking carp, sir. <laughs> yeah. It's like all the people of America, you know, you look man, those Americans look good. Look at all the Olympics we won. But our population's <laughs> getting more radioactive every year and we did nothing for the last year and a half over Fukushima. And the jobs are all gone and the terror uh, the fascism is growing and uh whoopee. And we're headed towards WW three. We, we, we can fix that in six months with repentance, with action, and with a little bit of honesty, which we don't have. I call this new statement <laughs> turning to God. That's the first step. It's the most important step. Absolutely. And uh, the timeline is moving on. We're heading into the fall shortly, and this Labor Day is coming. Getting closer and closer to the end of 2012. And it's going to be different than what people expect. It won't be the end of the world, but it's going to be a hell of a pre-show. Let's put it that way. <laughs> God bless Back tomorrow with Firing Line and much more and preparedness. You don't want to miss a report from John Moore. Take care, everybody, and take action.